Ah, Murray, come inside. Thanks. Grab a seat, make yourself comfortable. Thank you. You know, we've been um, thinking of a little project and um, we were wondering if uh, you might have the time to handle this little project for us. That sounds interesting, tell me more. Well, basically the thinking is to get some kids involved in, um, in some IT training and then with the final goal of getting these guys to perhaps start their own businesses or alternately to specialise in one of the fields of IT. It's going to be a lot of hard work, but do um, you think you can handle it? Um, we have to go through all the various stages. Um, it's going to be lots of hard work, like you said, but yeah, I definitely can do it. And you know what? I've got just the kids who can help us. You know what? I knew I could rely on you. So where do we start? Well, at the very beginning, with programming. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the difference between high-level programming language, assembly language, and machine language. Come on, Morva, it's good to see you again. Hi, Mari. Are you ready for this little adventure we're about to go oh, on? We can't wait. You bet. <laughs> Cool, but before you get too excited, I've got to warn you, like everything else in life, we've got to cover the basics first. What are we waiting for? Okay! Now, in the past, you've seen how to develop spreadsheet applications and database applications as software solutions to problems. In this series, we're going to turn our attention to solving problems by writing programs using Java programming language. I've heard of different languages like C++, Java, and Dolphin. But in DOT representation lessons, we learned that a computer only understands zeros and ones. So how does this work? Morwa, you're quite right. Computers only understand zeros and ones. In other words, a computer only recognizes words with specific bit patterns as different instructions. We call this set of instructions machine language or the machine code of the computer. But now, is that the same as a program? No, Kamal, it's not. A program is a set of machine language instructions that a computer executes one by one. When programs were first developed, they were all written in machine language. Now we write programs in high-level language. Now that's the language we all understand. As we've just seen, a computer only understands machine language, which is a set of specific bit patterns, each one representing a different instruction for a specific computer. That means machine languages are machine-dependent. Hang on a minute. Are you saying that machine language is a particular set of codes that can only be used by one type of computer? Exactly. Computers with different CPUs can't understand each other's machine language. For instance, the machine language of an Intel Pentium CPU can't be understood by an AMD CPU. But how come the computers we are using today understand each other? Ah, because things have changed over the years. <laughs> The early computer programmers had to actually load the bit patterns of zeros and ones into the computer's memory and then press a switch for the computer to start executing the program. Wow, that must have been hectic and very boring. I would have made loads of mistakes. <laughs> Fortunately, Morwa, the programmers back then discovered that they could use their computers to help with the programming process. But how? Aha. They gave each instruction or command in machine language an English-like abbreviation to represent the actual bit pattern. They also gave names to the memory locations that held the data the program had to use. Once they'd done that, they could write programs using these abbreviations and the names of the variables. For example, LDA price means load price. Add that means add the value contained in that to price and stow cost means store the value obtained in a variable called cost. The set of abbreviations and rules and the variable names used for the memory locations is called the assembly language. 
That must have been easier than using machine language, but I still don't understand how they use their computers to help them. Well, these English-like abbreviations and names, hmm? they had to be translated into the corresponding bit patterns of that particular machine's language. Now, as you know, a computer is ideal for doing repetitive tasks, and the translation of assembly language into machine language is very repetitive. So programmers wrote programs called assemblers. An assembler program translated assembly language into machine language. This, in turn, allowed the CPU to be able to execute it. So, programmers wrote lots of assembly language programs that could be translated into machine language using one assembler. Right! But that still seems a bit complicated. Was, Kamal. So, computer scientists, well, they didn't stop there. They went on to develop what we call high-level programming languages, such as C++, COBOL, Delphi, Java, Pascal, Visual Basic. All these languages are much more English-like than machine language, and they use many of the same symbols that we use in maths. So, for example, in Java, we could write cost gets the value of price and VAT added together. Does high-level language also have to be translated into machine language? Yes, it does, Morwa. And we call a program that translates high-level language or the source code into machine language or the object code a compiler. Now, a source code is a program made up of a series of statements written in high-level computer programming language, usually consisting of several text files. So, can one compiler translate different high-level languages? No, come on, it can't. Generally, a particular compiler translates a program written in a particular high-level language, such as um, C++, into machine language for a specific machine to execute. For example, a compiler could be written for an Apple Macintosh CPU to execute. So, to sum up, a compiler, it takes the source code and translates it into machine language or machine code, which is also known as the object code. And the object code is then loaded into the computer's memory and executed. Right, Morwa. Now, besides compilers, we also have what we call interpreters. Right, now an interpreter takes a program one line at a time, translates it into machine code, and then loads it into the computer's memory to be executed before going on to the next line. Will we be using a compiler or an interpreter? Yeah, and will we be using Java? The answer is yes to both questions. Java developers wanted programs written in Java to be able to run on any machine. But, as we've seen, machine language is different for every type of computer. So, they decided to define a virtual machine which would run with any machine language. Virtual? Does that mean it doesn't really exist? You're so right, Mola. It's a hypothetical or imaginary machine that has instructions set like an actual computer. The virtual machine understands program code in a particular file format. Java programs are built to be run on Java virtual machines and are compiled into bytecode. Basically, bytecode is made up of files composed of binary data. So, an interpreter is needed to translate the bytecode into machine language in order for a particular computer to be able to execute it. Does that mean that every different kind of computer needs to have a different bytecode interpreter? Yes, it does. But bytecode interpreters or Java virtual machines are available free on the internet and also come built in with most browsers. What about the compilers? Are they also free? Indeed they are, Kamo. And I'll show you how to download what we need from the internet later. But first, I want to talk about how we create and run a program. No matter what programming language we use, first we must create a source code file on the hard disk. The programmer then gives a command to run the compiler. After this process, the programmer can give another command to run the program. Notice that the programmer writes and saves the source code, runs the compiler and then executes the program. But there are unseen processes happening to make the program run. Have a look at the flowchart to see how the whole process works. First, the programmer types the program into an editor, such as Notepad, and saves it. 
This source file contains the program written in a high-level language which the machine doesn't understand. So next, the programmer runs the compiler with the source code as input. Then, a file with the object code as output is ready to be run by the computer. Now, the programmer can give a command to the operating system to load and run this object code. So, we need an editor and a compiler if we want to create a program. And, if it's a Java program, we also need a bytecode interpreter as well as a debugger. What's a debugger? Well, quite often programmers, they don't get their programs quite right the first time. And if you can't figure out what's wrong with the code just by examining it, you can use a debugger to go through line by line to see what each line is doing. This tells the programmer whether the code is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So a debugger literally helps to find and get rid of any bugs in your program. Exactly. Now, there are two ways to create a Java program. The first is to type out the program in an editor, such as Notepad, and save it. Then, the path must be set to the Notepad file. That means that you have to physically type in some commands each time you want to run the program. The second and easier way to create Java programs is to use an Integrated Development Environment, or IDE. An Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, is a program that provides a programmer with the tools needed to write, compile, run, and debug their programs in one package. There are a number of different IDEs for Java, but for this series of lessons, we will be using an IDE called JGrasp, which again is available free on the internet. <laughs> it looks like we're going to have to download a lot of files off the internet. Fortunately, Sun Microsystems has bundled the bytecode interpreter, the debugger and compiler and other useful programs into something called the Java Development Kit or the JDK. It's also sometimes referred to as the Software Development Kit or SDK, but whichever one is available, it can all be downloaded in one go. But unfortunately, that's going to have to wait until next time because we've come to the end of today's lesson. Next time, I'll show you how to download and install the Java Development Kit and the IDE JGrasp. Meanwhile, your task for today is to Explain the difference between a high-level programming language, an assembly programming language, and machine language. Guys, I'm very sad. Time to say goodbye, man. I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>